I get so many questions from viewers who, like me, are a little bit smaller in stature, asking for advice on how to set up your bikes. In fact, there's so many questions that I don't have time to answer them all in the comments and by email. So I hope this video goes some way to helping you out. Now, although I have kept hope alive that I might finally have a growth spurt and end up taller than my younger sister, I think I'm gonna be waiting forever at this rate. So I've had to get used to being 157 centimeters tall. That's five foot, 1.8 inches for our American viewers. And over the years racing and training, I've ridden bikes that I loved and just felt fantastic on. And I've also had to ride bikes that were frankly too big and on which I felt uncomfortable and downright unsafe. I think I've learned some things along the way and I would like to share those details with you. I'm using my Canyon Ultimate to demonstrate and the smallest sizes of this bike, mine included because it's a triple XS, have smaller wheels. More on that later. Now, I think the most important parameter for smaller cyclists is reach. Saddle height is very rarely an issue. And just because you can just about reach the handlebars does not necessarily mean that the reach is okay. Because if you're stretched out and your hips are rocked forward just to reach the hoods, well, that's gonna give you lower back pain, possibly shoulder pain, neck pain, and that rocking on the saddle uh, can give you saddle problems as well. So you wanna look for a bike where the top tube genuinely is quite short. There's actually quite a lot of difference between the actual sizes and reach of smallest frames by all the different various manufacturers. So go for a frame where the top tube really is genuinely short. Of course, reducing the top tube length does bring the front and back wheels closer together and that can increase toe crossover, which is a real bane for small cyclists. Now I have only a tiny bit of toe crossover on this bike, but in the past I've ridden 700C bikes where I had toe crossover from one o'clock to five o'clock, which is pretty bad. And toe crossover obviously is a bit of a problem for bike handling. At any rate, it's the excuse I still use for not being able to do a track stand. I'm afraid that if you have 700C wheels, you may just have to put up with a certain amount of toe crossover. There are a couple of ways that frame manufacturers try to reduce toe crossover whilst keeping the reach nice and short. One of them is making seat tube angle steeper. Another solution that they go for is to increase the fork offset. Do not fear though, there is another revolutionary, if you'll pardon the pun, solution to toe crossover. So it's time to talk about smaller wheels, specifically 650B and 650C. I'm gonna put it out there straight away. I'm a big fan of smaller wheels. I find that with smaller wheels on my road bike, I have better bike handling, I have less toe crossover, and specifically I have much better bike handling in crosswinds because the smaller area of the front wheel as seen from the side catches less wind. I have a special affection for 650C because when I won the World Championships time trial in Geelong, I was on a P3 with 650C wheels. And I'm absolutely certain that I could not have got aero enough on a 700C bike uh, to win that race. So I really like those wheels. That said though, I've done loads of races, uh, road races with 700C wheels. Um, and I've had 700C road bikes that I feel really comfortable on. So a lot of people ask me, why don't you just ride 650 all the time? Well, there's a couple of problems. So firstly, there aren't that many road bike manufacturers that make uh, the road bikes with 700C wheels. And secondly, in a road race, um, if you get a puncture, you're very unlikely to get a spare wheel from the neutral service if you run 650s. Um, I know because I've tried <laughs> and it went horribly wrong. So uh, for that reason, I always use 700C wheels in road races and I still do on my road bike. It just makes life a bit more simple um, if I ever do uh, the odd race or sportive. Um, that said, for events where you fix your own punctures like triathlon, um, sportives usually, um, and or, or races where you have a dedicated team car right behind you like a, a time trial at a professional level, I think 650 is a really good option for smaller riders because you either have to fix the puncture yourself, so you take your own inner tubes, etc., or your team car has the right wheels for you behind you. And yes, running 650 does reduce the choice you have of wheels, tires, and tubes, but there is choice out there, and um, that choice, I think, hopefully, is gonna increase as more of us small people demand bikes that fit. Now, it is true that smaller wheels have slightly higher rolling resistance, but the science shows that this is more than made up for by lower drag and lower weight because the wheels are smaller. Um, it's not like riding off-road where the size of the obstacles is significant relative to the wheel size because on the road, any roughness in the road surface is usually on quite a small scale. Now, for most cyclists, comfort comes before aerodynamics, and that is absolutely right. But if you're one of the people that wants to go faster, well, if the front end of your bike is too high, you won't be able to get low 
to get aero and save drag. And there's a particularly a problem for smaller cyclists because, well, your saddle's not very high, so your handlebars have to be relatively low. Now, as I mentioned before, with 650 wheels, you can get lower at the front because the wheel itself is closer to the ground, the hub of the wheel. Um, with a 700C frame, you want to look at what the head tube height is because if it's too big, there's not much you can do. Yes, there are downwards sloping stems, but they bring you further forward as well. And there are double jointed stems, but they're a really heavy and quite an ugly solution. So if you look for a frame with a, quite a small head tube height, if it's too low, you can always add spaces under the stem, but if it's too high, there's not much you can do. Now, crank length might sound like a minor detail, but it is an absolutely crucial consideration for smaller cyclists. Think about it this way. If you have shorter legs, then you have less of a range of motion in absolute terms than someone with long legs. But a longer crank means that your pedal turns a bigger circle. So at the bottom of the pedal stroke, your foot's quite low and you have to have your saddle low to reach. But at the top of the pedal stroke with a long crank, your foot would come higher than it would with a short crank, which brings your knee higher, and then you hit your knee in your stomach, in my case. Especially, especially, this is a problem if you're getting low to try and be aero or in time trials. That's why shorter cranks, basically, are much easier to pedal with for smaller cyclists. So for most smaller riders, it is worth considering a shorter crank, both for comfort and to avoid injury risk to your knees and hips, as well as potential saddle problems from rocking side to side. Personally, I noticed a huge improvement in my riding and my results uh, when I went from a 170mm crank to a 165mm crank like this one. 165s are actually fairly commonly available nowadays and I know some small riders who even use a 155mm crank, so there you go. Now, some people might tell you that uh, if you have a shorter crank, you have less torque and therefore less power and I'm afraid that is just rubbish science because yes, you do have less torque but you have a higher cadence for the same foot speed and your power is a function of torque and cadence. So while it might take a little while to adapt your coordination to pedaling at that higher cadence, once you've got that coordination dialed, shorter crank should not have a detrimental effect on your power. What you do need to be careful about though is that you have a small enough gear to maintain that higher cadence even on the steepest climbs you're gonna be tackling. Now one thing that really stands out for smaller riders is handlebar width. Now that's partly because it can look quite silly when someone with narrow shoulders is riding on really wide bars. Am I right viewers? Mm -hmm. Now personally, I find that any handlebar wider than 38 centimetres feels really clumsy and uncomfortable. And actually I prefer it if my handlebars are about 36 centimetres wide at the hood. That feels much better. But, but, that said, having a too wide handlebar isn't the end of the world. It just changes the handling slightly doesn't hugely increase the reach from your saddle, although very slightly. What is a problem though, is, that, is if the curvature, the radius of the drop curve is too big. Now, if you're not super tall, the chances are that you also have small hands. I certainly do. And it's one of the things that is really uncomfortable for me on bikes that are set up wrong, is having the wrong reach of the brake levers. Uh, it's not just uncomfortable for your hands to be working at full extension the whole time. It's also dangerous because you can't reach the brake levers in a hurry when you need them. Or, even worse actually, you could ride the whole time with your hands on the brake levers just in case, and then you risk grabbing them when you're startled, which can lead to crashing. So, getting a group set where you can adjust the reach of the levers is super important, and you can always find that out when you're buying a group set. Another detail of handlebar setup that is crucial for smaller people is the angle you set up the handlebar and the position of the hoods on the bar. And there's a reason I've left these handlebars untaped for the moment. It's because I want to show you how much of a difference it can make where you put the hoods on the bar and the angle you have the bar at. So I've loosened off the stem bolts. Check. And you'll see that changing the angle here hugely changes distance from the saddle to the hoods, which is where I hold on to the handlebars. If you move it back up there, it makes it much closer and easier to reach. Similarly, if you adjust the position of the hood on the bar, you can actually move the hoods much closer to the saddle and thereby reduce the reach. For example, that difference in 
hood position on the handlebar makes four centimeters difference to the reach. The important thing though to remember is that changing the position of the hood on the handlebar won't just affect the reach from the saddle to the hood, but also the distance from the brake lever to the handlebar, which is another thing that we've talked about for small hands. So you need to find a balance. I would say you set up the reach first and get the handlebar at the right angle for you, and then worry about the, uh, the reach of the brake levers. Now I think it's important to mention how hard it can be to change gear with mechanical shifters if your levers are too far away and you have small hands because you're having to apply that lateral force at full hand extension. And that's actually why I much prefer electronic shifters even though I know they're not necessarily faster but for me I feel much more comfortable on them because you just need a quick tap of the finger and uh, my pathetic weak little hands don't get as tired and I can change gear in a hurry when I need to. While we're talking about small hands the design of the brake hoods is also really important. For example, there are some group sets where the brake hoods are so wide I can't actually get my hands fully around them. And that's pretty unsafe because it means that your hands aren't as secure and you can bounce off on bumpy roads. I've actually crashed that way twice in training and it wasn't very nice. So I always go for a nice, neat hood design, which depends on the group set. I'd like to finish off with some of the details that are actually really important for smaller cyclists. Firstly, space for bottle cages. If you have a small frame, this triangle is smaller and you literally have less space to fit bottles and bottle cages in. You might even struggle to get one bottle in and out. I know for me it's pretty tight. Uh, two bottle cages can be really pushing it. Secondly, stem length. Now if you need a short stem to get the appropriate reach, that can make the handling of the front very twitchy. It's just something that you have to put up with to get the right reach. Lastly, space over the back wheel. So if you ride 700c wheels, there won't be that much space, if you're short, between the saddle height and the back wheel. And that means that if you're into bike packing and bike touring, if you have one of those giant saddlebags, there's a risk that it actually rubs on the back wheel. And I've tried that, it's suboptimal, both for your speed and for the integrity of your saddlebag. And then lastly, also due to having a low saddle in relation to the back wheel, if you put a rear light on the seat post, for the dark days, um, you might find that that rear light is actually below the height of the back wheel. And that means obviously it's much less visible to motorists. So you want to think about putting lights higher up, say actually on the saddle or on yourself. Well, I really hope this video helps those of you who ask me for advice on this huge topic. I mean, it's a huge topic for those of us who are not huge. If you liked it, give us a thumbs up. Feel free to share it with your small friends or indeed your tall friends who do not appreciate how hard it is being small. And if you do have any more questions, leave them in the comments below. I will do my best to find an expert and answer them for you. In the meantime, you might like to watch this video on why power to weight is maybe not as important as everyone thinks. Sorry. <laughs>